The following contains spoilers, so proceed with caution. Hey everyone, welcome to Digital Charcuterie. I'm James. Joining me today is Andrew. Andrew, thanks so much for being on the show. Hey, you're welcome. I'm very glad to be here because I work for DC. That's not that I, I lied. I don't work for DC. I just wanted to get people a little bit excited um, because <laughs> we are also DC in a sense. And every time I text you about this show, I'm so tempted to save time and write DC instead of digital charcuterie. But I'm like, what if I get the point across wrong? And he thinks like, why is, why is he talking yeah. about DC comics? No, you know, what's funny is when I first came up with digital charcuterie, I think it's like five or six years ago, I came up with a name and read mm-hmm. it made the it's a great name. And I was like, okay, DC. And I was trying to come up with a logo. And at one point I just had the DC comics logo. And I was like, Oh no. <laughs> Like that was very early on when I was thinking of stuff. I was like, oh man, we can't even be DC. And then like some of the videos will be like, hey DC fans, but I'm referring to Detective Comics. <laughs> and it's but but then like the logo is like full on the screen. I'm like, well, whatever. I'm, I'm we're full of ourselves. But it's a lot of fun. Um, but you're on the show today because we have three topics to talk about. We're gonna talk about the Riddler pre- prequel comic coming and what that is going to be, and we're gonna break that down as much as we can. We're gonna talk about uh, your fan favorite lady sticks over at Blue Beetle, the big bad of Blue Beetle, potentially, and mm-hmm. uh, more Morbius. We're gonna, we are going to talk some some Marvel, even though it's on the Sony side of things. But Morbius is um, it's a movie coming out. Is what we'll say. I mean, it's, it's well, that's, that's debatable, it's, James. It's, true. <laughs> it's a movie it, coming out. Yeah, at some point it's coming out. So we're gonna talk about. It. Let's get right into the the Riddler. On, on after the movie, after we all saw the Batman, there was the rattleadda.com, rattleadda ding dong, and people went on the website and then they were like, Oh, it's gonna be something's gonna be revealed. And the first thing that was revealed was like all of his notes. I don't know if you did that, but all of the Riddler's notes from the movie were mm-hmm. there. Uh, they're pretty cool to look at. Um, they didn't really tell you much. I kind I kind of like to think though, Andrew, that 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 is um, a precursor to possibly a Batman two, where in the sequel to the Batman, all of the Riddler's notes are out in the public, and the public has all of his notes available to them. But but that is neither here nor there. And then another one came out, and then Matt Reeves tweeted on Friday, and it was right while we were recording, I believe. Actually, we're doing a live show on Friday. He he, he tweeted out that uh, Paul Dano will be writing a Riddler prequel comic book limited series six episode six episode six issue comic for dc black label which is their like intense rated r label is riddler a year or year one by paul damo and stevon subich i don't know how to pronounce his name i name i apologize for my horrible linguistics uh, it's a six it. <laughs> perfect it's a six issue bi-monthly limited series to launch october this year 2022 and andrew goes on to say that for many film and comic book fans paul dano's portrayal of the riddler and matt reeves the batman in theaters now was arguably one of the most chilling and terrifying incarnations ever seen in a Batman film. This October, fans will have the opportunity to learn more about the Riddler's origins in Riddler Year One, a six-issue by monthly DC Black Label series written by the Batman actor Paul Dano with art by acclaimed European illustrator Stevan Subich, making his DC debut. This series explores the background of how accountant Edward Nashton went from a simple Gotham city and nobody to be cutting to becoming batman's nemesis setting them on a collision course in the blockbuster feature film for the latest updates on riddler year one and the world's greatest superheroes visit the dc website dccomics.com and follow them everywhere that you can follow them and you can buy tickets for the batman online so andrew you haven't read the prequel novel but when you look at when you look at this you're a huge Riddler fan. We got to bring. We got to also mention that you're a massive Riddler fan. Where where does this take you? What what are your hopes and expectations from hearing this? Well, the one thing that makes me feel like this could be something special is the fact that Paul Dano is writing it. Um, that's that's for me. When you sent me this news, my first thought was, I don't think this counts as news unless Paul Dano's involved, and then it says Paul Dano's involved. So. I'm really curious. Like, I don't know what this guy has written before, if anything. We don't know what his writing talents are. Uh, but clearly he loves the character enough to do this, to dive into this. Now, if this is a prequel, and obviously the novel's a prequel, is there overlap? What is this going to tell us that the novel doesn't? Is this just an adaptation of the novel? 
I'm of a mixed mind because as much as I love the Riddler, I am I, I've never read good movie tie-in material in my life. Period. I have never. It does not exist as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and the idea of a movie tie-in comic of the Riddler, even if it's written by the guy playing the Riddler, it's still a bunch of raised like red flags for me because I can't help thinking like why should I care about this given the track record of movie tie-in material? So I'm really curious. You said it's bi-weekly six, sorry, bi-monthly six yeah. issues. Okay. So that means it's going to take a year for this story to finish by October, 2023. It will be done. Um, that's, that's a long time for a, a six issue time. thing. Yeah. Um, Paul Dano must be a slow writer. I don't know what's happening there. I don't know why they're pacing it out that way, but if you're going to tell a story that takes that long to tell, it better be damn good. And that's the paradox because if it's damn good, why wasn't it part of the movie? Uh, and so I'm just, I'm really <laughs> fittingly enough. I'm really just full of questions uh, when it comes to this Riddler story. So I don't, well, I don't think it, I don't think it would have made sense to be part of the movie because it's before the movie. Right. And the right. prequel, the prequel novel is it's, uh, almost, it's not really 50-50, but it's almost 50-50 Bruce Wayne and Edward Nashton. And you see them kind of before they become their iconic figureheads. And and the Rid the Riddler in, in this universe definitely has parallels to the comic book. Um, what I liked about it was um, that he's a delivery, like an Uber Eats delivery driver, like skip the dishes kind of guy. At one point, he loves doing riddles on his spare time. But he is he is an orphan, and he grew up in Wayne Manor, which is was converted into an orphanage, and that's why in the movie they live out the the Wayne and 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 Alfred and Dory, not Aunt Harriet, live in Wayne Tower because the orphan the Wayne Manor has been converted to an orphanage, and at some point, so I guess spoilers for the prequel novel. If you haven't read the prequel novel, we should get into that. But I'm I'm sure if you haven't read it by now, you're you're probably not going to. What what's the name of that novel? Uh, it's like Batman, a prequel novel, I think. It's not like... Oh, okay. It's not, it's not, it's not, I have it on, I think. Um, yeah, it's just like a prequel novel called The Batman or whatever. But so it goes half and half, and you figure it out. But as it goes on, the Riddler is kind of like he has no place in society. Like, he feels like he doesn't belong anywhere. He's alone. You know, he, the people at the orphanage are nice to him, but he doesn't really care. Um, and then he becomes a, a, a delivery driver for a, an Italian restaurant. And he, and he delivers the food all around. And then one night there's a, a car race in it. And Bruce Wayne is a part of this. And he, and he causes an accident for the car. And he feels really good about it. And that's kind of his, the catalyst of becoming the Riddler. And it, and then he burns down Wayne Manor. But the thing with Wayne Manor that's really that always kind of struck me when I read it especially was that he pulls the fire alarm before he sets it on fire. So all the orphans and the workers and everyone, they leave. Like everyone is out of the orphanage. And then he sets it on fire and it, the fire truck gets there before it's able to completely burn down. As you see in the movie, it's kind of like, you know, this rundown shack, uh, which is great. But I always love that aspect of it. And then you compare this to some, um, what is it, Detective Comics annual Batman or year one or whatever it is, where the Riddler has his origin there. And, and in that one, he kind of, he commits crimes, but he, ha he doesn't feel the pleasure in committing the crimes. And he wants, so he elevates it to the riddles, which he's very good at. And that's what I kind of feel was happening in this prequel novel where they never really got there, but it was like, he's committing these crimes and he feels good about it, but he does, he feels almost empty. It's like eating a donut, which I like to say, like, it's mm. like empty calories, right? It's like, he's like, I did this, but no one acknowledges that I did it. Like no one knows that I did it. And where's the the cleverness of it all because he's so clever and he loves his puzzles um and of course he becomes an accountant and in, in, in all that stuff uh so i'm i kind of hope they just they play from i don't i hope they don't dabble in that novel at all it's a it's a young adult novel like it's 100 pages 70 whatever it is it's really short it takes like an hour to read i hope they don't dabble in that at all there's no overlap i hope it expands it takes after that right it's like he's, he could be a riddler committing these crimes and he's like this isn't for me and I, I i gotta there has to be a moment you know when jigsaw and saw is like no we're gonna play a game that's i hope we get a moment like that where we realize no we need to play games people are smart i have to show people that they're smarter than this and the other side andrew is in the movie we learn about all the corruption in gotham city and that's something that could also be explored in this maybe not at the forefront because it is a riddler novel but on the back you know the back burner while the riddler is going on little tidbits of information about Gotham being rotten and then he can discover more about 
Thomas Wayne and the Waynes and Arkham and all that stuff. And then the Falcone, Maroney and, and all the, the mob dealings and stuff like that. And I'm really hoping we get that, but I hope there's no overlap with the, the book and the comic. And I don't think there would be, but Paul Dano is Andrew, a massive uh, Batman comic fan. Like, they shot this movie for 700 years because of COVID. And apparently he had so much downtime and they were basically isolated in their hotel rooms. All he did was read Batman comics the entire time. Nice. That's dedication. It's always exciting when you know the person making the movie or making the character is a fan because you know they're going to do their best. They're not going to be flipping about it. Um, one thing the comic could touch on then, because it sounds like, you know, in the novel, he's an arsonist, but not quite a murderer. And from the first frame of the movie, he's already a serial killer. So the the comic might be about his first time taking a life, James. It might be about the yeah. first time he plunges a ballpoint pen into somebody's neck or something. I don't know. I don't know what he's going to do. It could be anything. Uh, I'm still just of the mind that movie tie-in material, it, you know, this is not something where there's a good story to tell. It's always a commercial with a plot. Um, so I'm I'm going to be hesitant. I'm not going to be like rushing to buy this the day it comes out. I'll probably just look up the plot online. And if it sounds like it's something interesting, then maybe I'll read. But I, I really can't get excited about movie tie-ins. I just can't. I got... I gotta tell you, like I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this because I like the Riddler, and I'm looking forward to seeing what Paul Dano has to say about that. But, but again, I say this about Star Wars all the time at Rebel Scum. I, it's like, okay, great, but why isn't this a limited series on HBO Max? Like we're getting the Penguin limited series, so why right. is this just a comic? But at the same time, comics have value, and, and I really appreciate comics, and especially when the Batman comes from comic, it almost makes sense to go there. But again. You know why wouldn't this be a limited series? I'm pretty sure Paul Dana would come back to do six episodes of of a series. But I'm looking forward to seeing what more we can get out of the Riddler because I'm hoping the Riddler comes back in a sequel and possibly even a third film. Like I'm hoping the Riddler sticks around with us and is might not be the 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 main antagonist going forward, but is an antagonist and you know really really uh, ties Batman's hands behind his back with his riddles and and whatnot. Because I mean the Riddler, the one thing that's great about that scene with the Joker and the Riddler in the movie is that the the Joker could utilize the Riddler. Like, other villains in Gotham could utilize the Riddler because of his clever uh, schemes and, and question marks and all that. Like, they can use him to their advantage as well, and he'd be up for it because he's trying to get his thing out of it. And that's that's one thing that I liked about that scene is it could have been any villain in that room with him, but the idea that these two villains are now together is like, oh, this could be, this could be bad for everybody. Like, could you imagine, like, a villain with smarts, like Bane or, like, a... Uh, Two Face, like Harvey Dent and the Riddler teaming up to take on, or Mister Freeze even is a doc, like a doctor. So you t- you know you take these smart villains, not like I mean the Joker's. I know how you feel about the Joker, but you take like a smart villain with some brains, you team them up with the Riddler, you can get some really cool fun going on. But to that end, maybe maybe he comes in contact with other uh, Gotham Rogues Gallery villains in this comic book because we know the Joker has been in arkham for a year or, or it's an anniversary anyway so at least a year you'd have to guess and batman's only on year two and i mean obviously he doesn't meet the riddler but other other villains could potentially show up in this comic oh yeah and you know the world building of gotham is something that we're all really looking forward to they could do something that i don't think the movies have really touched on yet but the comics and like everything else does it a lot which is the idea of the villains, Batman's villains are not the kind of bad guys who like to team up and shake hands and put aside the differences. They're usually like, this is my part of the city. And if you cross that line, my people are killing your people. Uh, so imagine getting a Batman 2 where it's like Two-Face is there and Riddler is there, but they're not pals. They are causing just as much chaos for each other as they are for Batman. Uh, I don't think you've seen that yet too much in the movies. Like Mr. Freeze and Poison Ivy, even though they end up not being friends, like they are teamed up for most of that movie. Uh-huh. Um, Two-Face and Joker in the Dark Knight, they don't really, they only interact really once and it's not really, they don't really affect each other all that much afterwards. Two-Face well, just comes up and does his own thing. In this Batman movie, they kind of do that though. Like Penguin's very separate, Catwoman's very, like they're not helping each other out. They have their own plot lines going on as they connect obviously but their own plot lines are going on i think that's the only way to really do it in a film though is they have to somehow connect to the overall plot otherwise it might feel a little disjointed 
Yeah, you just got to find that right balance so that it's not, you know, a super team of villains. It's, you know, this is where Riddler's goons are. This is where Joker's goons are. Like a very Arkham City kind of thing. And like, you know that there's gang wars going on, except it's not between Falcone and these mobsters. It's between a bunch of clown people and a bunch of plant people. Uh, you could have a lot of fun with that. And it might fit the tone of these. I don't know. But these, uh, the whole prequel comic thing is something that I will be sitting out. Well, that's just me. No, I'm going to force you to do it. And we're going to review them on the channel. We're going to talk <laughs> about each one. Each, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I think Paul Dano, Dano obviously built a backstory for himself. I think some of that was probably used in the prequel novel. Some of Matt Reeves notes in his notes were probably used in that novel. And I think mm -hmm. he has a cool little story that he wants to tell. And, you know, he's, he's, he's an actor, right? And he's a, he's a filmmaker. So he probably was like, I want to dabble in comics. That's what I want to do. And I, so I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Again, though, the question is, why wouldn't this be on HBO Max when they're, you know, HBO Max could use content and they're getting the Penguin and possibly Arkham Asylum and some Catwoman stuff is also being rumored. All right, Andrew, let's move on to our next topic today. Uh, we're sticking on the DC Detective Comic side of things here. We're going to talk a little bit about Blue Beetle. Blue Beetle went from HBO Max to August 2023 in movie theaters. Uh, I my 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 guess on this is that, and I said this to you before we recorded, is I'm thinking maybe the theatrical world is where they're going to live with the the Justice League stuff, and that's where they're going to have all that kind of uh, films. And then on HBO Max, that's going to be their Gotham Knights stuff going on there, which they've announced is in development. Uh, we're going to get a Red Hood movie in development. Uh, Nightwing's coming. All that stuff is fun. Batgirl is obviously on its way. They're shooting now, and it's going to lead up into Gotham Knights. All that being said. Now it's being rumored, reportedly rumored, that the big bad in Blue Beetle, they're saying, is going to be like a, is going to be a big threat. And they're calling this threat Lady Sticks. That is who they are. This is not confirmed. This is what the rumor mill is having. And they're just, I think they start shooting next month, just a few weeks away. They start shooting this film. Andrew, you are a huge Lady Sticks fan. Uh, you also love the band Sticks. Anytime they have something with Sticks in it with an X, you are all in. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about Lady Sticks and what you hope to see from Lady Sticks in the Blue Beetle film. I'm all in. I can't wait to convert <laughs> to Greek orthodoxy so that when I die, I can literally cross the river Sticks into the underworld. That's It's all about the Sticks. Uh, Lady Sticks is a, a cool choice. She's interesting. She is kind of a newer DC character. She showed up in 52, that story 52, which is, oh God, it's older. It's almost 20 years old now. Holy cow, we're getting old, James. Uh, 52 Thanks. came out, uh, yeah. It, 52 came out, I think, I want to say around 2006, 2007, and it was a weekly series that DC did. It was very groundbreaking. There'd never been anything like it. And it was a really cool story because it, it took just this big like interwoven plot and it basically turned DC comics into an ensemble TV show, which I really like, you know, it's like this issue is going to be about steel. And then the next one is going to be about Renee Montoya and the question, like there was so much cool, like I love the way they did 52 and that's where Lady Sticks first showed up. And from what I read about her, she was kind of meant to be not quite on the level of dark side, but close. Like she was a big, alien monster villain, like high level threat, uh, like a threat enough that the Green Lantern Corps is always keeping an eye on her. And she is, I think primarily since her introduction, she's been used as a Blue Beetle villain. I've never read an actual Blue Beetle comic. Um, I know the character, I know his, his origin, how he works and stuff like that, but I never read any of his stories, but it sounds like she has become a mainstay villain of his. So that makes sense that they're putting her in this. Uh, she's a huge threat though which is interesting because it's they're not starting off small. They're starting off with a big gun. Uh, so it raises the questions of like, okay, what, because the director of this movie has already said he has plans for a Blue Beetle sequel. Um, and the only way I can think of that they could up the ante from sticks in terms of Blue Beetle is by bringing in Booster Gold and having it be a buddy movie. And I think that's like a, that would be a great plot. But anyways, Lady Sticks. I think that's, that's going to happen. I, I, I do think Booster oh, yeah. Gold is going to show up yet. Yeah. The fact that he hasn't shown up yet is crazy. He's like, he's super popular. It's, uh, not, it's, not, that, it's not that crazy when you think about Warner Brothers and DC. It's just, you're it's right. not, it actually makes more sense. You're absolutely right. <laughs> uh, 
Um, the Lady Styx is just this this giant alien woman, and I think she's got at least four arms, maybe six. I haven't counted her arms lately. I don't watch her every minute. I don't know what she's doing, but she's uh, she's a huge threat, um, and she kind of lives in that world of not only Blue Beetle, James, but she lives in the world of the Green Lanterns, and you know the Green Lanterns are always fighting alien villains, and as well, she lives in the world of Lobo. She crosses mm -hmm. paths with Lobo, the intergalactic bounty hunter, uh, quite a bit. So throwing her in there interests me because not only is it a great sort of Blue Beetle villain to throw in, like it works, and not only is it another cool part of the DC universe that we haven't seen yet, but she has so many connections to these other pockets of DC that it could open up a lot of doors. And now all of a sudden, if this rumor has any grain of truth to it, this Blue Beetle movie just got a whole lot more interesting, maybe to the point where these executives made that decision to cross over from HBO Max to theaters for a reason. Yeah, that's where I'm at. You know, we heard that DC has got their crap together and they seem to have an understanding of what they're doing. And that's why I said maybe Justice League is there and, and Gotham Knights is there. And I love the idea that this could open a door to everything. And I don't doubt the movie, but I, my concern with Lady Sticks being the big bad right away is I, it's like when you watch superhero movies now, for the most part, and I haven't seen Eternals yet, but I've heard the ending of Eternals is kind of like, wow, how do you like it's over the top huge, right? Like it's a. The problem is when you do that in a solo movie, what are the stakes when you team up? Like, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, like my problem with the first Avengers movie, well, one of my problems with the first Avengers movie is Loki. He was just a bad guy in Thor. And now it's like, I like that. Like, I know people love Loki, so don't knock me for that. But you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, it's like, you, you just went from Loki to Loki. Like, you just did a lateral move. Thanos right. made complete sense to me. Ultron's kind of there. But when you bring like a huge threat, like Loki could be big enough for the Avengers, but then he shouldn't be big enough. Like he should be too big for Thor is what I'm saying. Like, Exactly. If yeah. Thor can beat him in a solo movie, why is it yeah. more tense to put him against the whole team? Exactly. So that's my thing with Lady Six. Is if, if, if Lady Six can be defeated by Blue Beetle, maybe Booster Gold shows up. But if Blue, well, like what is next? Like how do you – and I almost feel like – one of the things I loved about Joker, I mean, it's kind of a weird one. So I'm, I got to rack my brains into about another one that I can compare it to. But the thing with the Joker is it's very small and isolated and he just starts a movement at the end and that's it. It's like, oh, okay, great. But like when you watch, you know, like, man, I love Man of Steel, but the ending kind of, it starts to go over the top and you start to do these over the top things. It's like, at some point, you got to ground it a little bit and then get the team up to deal with that big, huge event. Like, I mean, this Man of Steel, Batman v Superman went right right to uh, Doomsday. Like, wow, here's Doomsday. And you're like, well, would you hold your pants for a second? Let's get, <laughs> let's get there. So that's my one concern with Lady Six and Blue Beetle is that maybe we're going there too soon. But at the same time, it's Blue Beetle. Blue Beetle is not Superman, not Spider-Man. You know, it's Blue Beetle could be Iron Man. I'll say that. Like, Blue Beetle could be on that level of popularity. Like, by the end of this, if they do a good job, that's that's who I will compare it to because Blue Beetle is known, not overly popular, kind of like how Iron Man was 15 years ago, 14 years ago, whenever that movie came out. That's what I mean. So, but again, in that Iron Man, it was uh, what was his name, Jebediah. It was just another like it was a small, isolated villain. It wasn't over the top, and that's uh, you know I, I I hope I'm looking forward to this movie a lot. I just worry that they're gonna they go too big too soon. Then you have to top yourself for the next one, and that's when. They st I, that's when I find these movies start to lose themselves is when they try to top what they've done. It's like, don't top it. Just give me a good story. I think it's really, it's like you mentioned Iron Man and I think that's a great way to draw a comparison there because you're right. When you get characters like Batman and Spider-Man, right? Half of the fun when it comes to, we're making a movie of this, half of the fun is like, oh my God, how are they going to do a live action Green Goblin how are they going to do a live action Mr. Freeze? Like, I'm really excited to see how they adapt these villains and bring them into the real, like it's, that's half the fun, right? When Batman Begins was coming out and we heard we were getting Scarecrow and Ra's al Ghul, we were like, oh, how are they going to do that? I'm so excited. When you get characters like Iron Man, nobody is sitting there thinking like, man, I, I can't wait to see how they adapt Obadiah Stane. Like it's, the villains of his world. Obadiah, Obadiah, Jebediah. Obadiah. <laughs> the villains of his world are just not. 
they don't have that mass love. They don't have that mass appeal. And Blue Beetle's the same way. Like, I could not name you one Blue Beetle villain except Lady Sticks, and that's only because I had to learn some more about her to talk about her today. Uh, <laughs> because in her first appearance, which I have read, I, I own 52, she doesn't fight Blue Beetle. She fights Starfire and Lobo and Adam Strange. But then from what I've read, she eventually becomes a Blue Beetle villain and a Green Lantern villain. Uh, so Blue Beetle's one of those characters who it's like, Nobody's sitting here thinking, oh man, I can't wait to see how they adapt the classic Blue Beetle villain, Joe. It's, it's a totally different animal. We can't even gauge it on the same level as we gauge the Supermans and the Spider-Mans of the world. So I think their best bet is use this giant villain as a way to not only introduce the world to Blue Beetle, but to introduce the concept that the DC movie universe has these intergalactic things that has Green Lanterns, it has possibly Lobo, it has etc. cetera. Uh, if they want to throw in Adam Strange and Starfire, that's groovy with me. I love those characters too. And then for a sequel, to up yourself, the sequel would probably not even focus so much on a crazy villain. But if you have Booster Gold in there for your sequel, it's the work is already almost half done for you because Booster Gold's a time traveler. That's his whole thing. So all of a sudden you've got you can have a plot in the sequel of Blue Beetle that is like right up there with the Flash movie in terms of the stuff that it can do, the twisty, turny, timey, wimey, multiversey stuff you can do and really play with that as a way to up the stakes as opposed to upping the stakes with a bigger villain or a more serious threat. Well, that works for me because I, like I, that's more for me. That's more uh, interesting as a plot as well than just well, we got to go take out the big bad this week. You know, it, it's yeah. I think for me it's it's getting it's getting played. And I think what you know, and I actually like Endgame. And the one thing that I really enjoyed about Endgame was it was more than just defeating the bad guy. It was like how it was like the path to get there is yeah. more enter. It's more entertaining than just oh, here's the fit. And you know what? I'm I'm old, right? I am old, and we all mm -hmm. know I'm old. But like I I when I have to sit through CG fighting now, I just I lose all I lose all interest. And I know you love Infinity War, but that like 90 minutes of uh, Space Dogs, I just like if I could go back to the 90s when Blockbuster used to cut out nudity out of movies to make it, <laughs> I would cut that out. I'd be like just cut it. Because it's an empty, like I hate empty threats. Also, as well, I also hate empty threats. You know that you know that none of the good guys are going to get killed by a s generic space dog, and it's not just Infinity War. I'm just using that as an example. They do this in um, what other movies do they just do that at? Well, I, I found I found they did it um, to their detriment in Shang Chi. Yes, yes. I thought, yes, I thought Wen Wu, right? right? He was Wen Wu is a great villain, and then it just became about let's fight this dragon, yeah. and I'm like. I kind of yeah. wish you didn't. Th that lost me, and um, oh, now I had the other one, and I forgot. See, I thought the space dogs were used better in Endgame than in Infinity War because Hawkeye. I'm like, well, Hawkeye could get killed by a space dog because yes. he just has a bow and arrow. Like, but but like when Thor and Rocket Raccoon and like they're going after, I'm like, these bit. There's no. This is pointless. Like that no. was my whole thing. Was this is pointless? Um, yeah. So I would like let's focus on the story and let the story unfold. And you know what? If you need Lady Sticks to be the one that gets me excited for the next one going back in time, let's do that then. And that's why Avengers 5, in order to work, it needs, you need to get rid of minions and armies and make it a team of villains versus a team of heroes. That's the only well, way you're going to get that. Marvel's getting, Marvel is, uh, some, I don't even, they're weird right now, man. They got the multiverse, <laughs> Midnight Suns, um, little, is, like. Is Midnight I, Suns real or is that just like something they're toying with? It's early it's development, but Oscar Isaac just mentioned it. Like it's happening. It's definitely going to happen. They, uh, I think it's smart though. Don't, I, I always say this. Don't give me the Avengers right now. We've had the Avengers. Let's work on other teams. Get the villains to team up, like figure out other mm -hmm. things, get establish a new, you have to establish something different than what we had. Cause if we just go through phase four five and six, and it's basically one, two, three with different people. I don't care. Like, right. well, I mean, but then at the same time I'm old and there's kids who are seeing it for the first time. So you can argue that case as well. But if you if you do and you have Midnight Suns here and like Young Avengers here, Fantastic Four here, like you and three Spider Man over here, like that, I'm in on that. Like, give me all that, and then they could come together for Giant Avengers, and they can take out whatever the heck threat they have next. 
on their docket. All right, Andrew, let's move on to our third and final uh, topic today. Uh, Morbius. I'm going to go see Mar Morbius on March 31st. I'm going to go see it the day before it comes out. I'm going to see it in the afternoon. I'm going to do an out-of-theater reaction. I don't know if I want to see it, but I'm going to see it. I'm hoping for a good time, but this doesn't seem to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> I Look, this movie was supposed to come out like uh, right around the pandemic. It got delayed because of the pandemic. It should have come out in January. I think if it came out in January and it flopped, people would have been like, eh, pandemic. But now it's like, uh, I don't know, Batman just did so well. Spider-Man, like... It's kind of strange, but I do want to bring this up. So uh, the rumor is right now, well, the word on the street is now is people are seeing this movie and they are hating, critics are not liking this movie. I don't even know if there's an embargo and if there is, it probably won't lift until like a week after the movie comes out. They're not happy with this movie at all. People aren't liking it. I saw some people online saying they've seen it and it's a mess, but some people are going to like it. They said they're like, some people are going to like this, but it's a giant mess. It just, it doesn't, the biggest problem is it doesn't know what universe it's in or what villains it allows itself to use in that universe. So it kind of just, lives in like some weird thing but someone did tweet this out and i i didn't save the tweet um but venom has a tomato meter which you know i hate ron tomatoes but a tomato meter score of 30 percent all right a ron tomatoes has 30 percent approval rating from 361 critics but the audience approval of venom 81 percent that's 51 percent more people like like it and that's from twenty five thousand plus that's a lot of people going on there being like, hey, we enjoyed this movie. And obviously they did because they made a sequel to it. I don't have the numbers for the sequel in front of me, but let's just go with Venom and this. Morbius, maybe this is another case where critics don't like it because it's not made for them. Uh, but audiences are going in, just like Uncharted. They're going in and being like, no, this is a better time than I thought. Do you think that could be the case with Morbius? Oh, boy. Uh James, I think you said the perfect thing that sums up this motion picture, which is, I don't know if I want to see it, but I'm going to see it. <laughs> I mean, it's like that... it's been like a carrot. If it would have come out the first time, I probably would have passed, but now I'm like, well, now I kind of got to see it. <laughs> that is, that they might as well use that in the marketing because <laughs> I, I can't think of a better sentence that sums up Morbius as a film. Because like, here's the thing. I feel the exact same way. Um, me and my group of friends, uh, like Tiago, uh, like Harmon, Chris, all, you've met those guys. They are all, we are all super Spider-Man nerds. We all grew up on that Spider-Man cartoon. Yeah. We are we are excited anytime the, anything Spider-Man happens. The 90s Spider-Man cartoon. The 90s Spider-Man cartoon. Yeah, not the super friends. Which had, which, had, which, had, which had Morbius in it. Yeah, that was my introduction to Morbius, in fact. Yeah. Um, so... Anytime anything Spider-Man related comes out, uh, like obviously No Way Home, the first Venom movie, the second Venom movie, we were like, yes, all right, let's go, guys. Come on, let's make plans. Let's get tickets. Let's go. And that conversation is starting to happen on WhatsApp of like, hey, Morbius has a release date. Who's going to get tickets? Whatever. But there's a difference in the conversation this time. And you can <laughs> feel it. You can feel the lack of electricity in the air, James. And it is that difference. It is that shared unspoken feeling between the six of us guys where we're all thinking the same thing. We're all thinking we don't really want to watch this movie, but we're all going to watch this movie. And I, I think it comes down to a little bit of what I said before regarding how Iron Man and Blue Beetle, like what you brought up to about the, their, their villains, you know, nobody cares. And it's, it's the same kind of situation here, but I feel like even more so every person I know who is talking about watching Morbius is always talking about the same thing is always talking about, I'm really curious to see what universe this is set in. Nobody I have ever talked to in the last four years or whatever that this movie was supposed to exist has said, I can't wait to go see the story of Michael Morbius. How, how bad is that? Like, it, should we care what universe? This is the problem. Like, why should we even care what universe? Like, because Venom, to that point, no one went to Venom being like, what universe is Venom in? No, we just want, went and watched Venom. But yeah, Morbius is, uh, it's this completely different beast. I feel like this movie looks like it came out at like around the Blade time. Like it was a, yes. like it was a, I love Blade and Blade too, but this looks like, you know, 
it came out at that time and it didn't quite nail it like spawn like it was kind of like you're like what just happened what i guess i saw it because it's a comic movie but that you know and it, it looks it feels like it has that sensibility about it and i don't know how i feel but also craven the hunter just got in, started shooting now that are you excited for that do you think your friends will have a different attitude towards that i think i don't know if they'll have a different attitude i mean i'm more excited for craven by like an inch only because i like Craven and Chameleon more as Spider-Man characters than I like Morbius. I always thought Morbius was just kind of a lame villain in that cartoon anyway. Um, but I'm still not like stoked for Craven. And I mean, this Morbius thing, like this is a, this is a problem. This is when, when all these artsy fartsy directors talk about how they hate Marvel and they hate what Marvel has done to the industry. You can't blame Marvel. Marvel's doing its own thing, but this is a reason, like, th this is a prime example of those artsy fartsy directors have a good point because all anybody is caring about with this movie is what shared universe does it fall yeah. under? And that's a big problem because that, who, nobody is going into this caring, like, oh man, I really hope that villain Matt Smith is playing is gonna, you know, like, nobody cares about that. Zero people. And it's, it's crazy to think that this movie is even going to exist because of just the lack of any kind of enthusiasm that seems to be put into it from any angle. So I just, I don't know. I want to know why this needed, why this story needed to be told because as even though I, I'm agreeing with those artsy fartsy directors on in this situation, what those directors don't understand is that pretty much every MCU movie that has come out has told a great story with great characters that made us care about them. Like they, they don't half-ass it. They cover all their bases. And, on, and the cherry on the Sunday is that it all connects. This just feels like just a cherry in an empty bowl. And that's not filling. I'm going to walk out of that still hungry and feeling like I didn't get my money's worth. I hope I it doesn't try to connect. Like, why can't, like Venom, I haven't seen the second Venom still, sorry. But like Venom never tried to connect. Any, I mean, I know the post credit scene for Venom. I've seen that, obviously, and I've seen No Way Home. But like, I, Venom doesn't try to connect anything. It's like, this is Venom. This is where Venom lives. Enjoy. Mm -hmm. Whereas this one already, we see a Spider-Man picture. We see a Vulture, and he mentions Venom. And it's like, okay, well, we're going down this weird path here. What, like, and my, you know, my weakness, my what I consider one of the weaknesses of the MC is when they shoehorn in the connective stuff and they're like, well, remember this guy from this? And you're like, I don't yeah. know. Like, and I mean, like think about of... it. I think the first Morbius trailer between the, I could be wrong, but the first Morbius trailer, if I remember right, was there like no connective tissue at all? And then the second Vulture. trailer. Okay. He was in the oh. first one. Oh, maybe I thought it was the first one, but I don't know. It's been two years. Like, yeah. <laughs> I can't even remember. Like that trailer, at least the second one that I remember is just like, here's a Spider-Man picture. Here's uh, Michael Keaton. Here's the Venom reference. And it's like, what are you really trying to sell? Like, so yeah, the, the first one had Vulture. At the, I think the first one had Vulture at the very, very end. And everybody thought that that was an end, like the post credit scene or the end mm. of the movie. And it looks like it's going to be like the middle of the movie or something like that. I don't know if it even, I think, to be fair though, we haven't seen the movie. And so they might be forced, like, there's no buzz for this movie. Like you said, it's kind of like, well, Morbius is coming out. Like, do people even know it's coming out on April 1st? I don't even, because that's April Fool's Day. And of all the movies to drop on April Fool's Day, it's Morbius, the one that... Yeah, that's, that's not a coincidence. Yeah, like, I don't think people are excited for this movie. And I think that trailer that you're that you're referring to was kind of saying, hey, you want to be excited for this because, look, there's Spider-Man and there's Vulture and there's Venom. And, like, that's... I think that's what they're saying. And I don't know... I mean, maybe it is, but I don't know if that is going to be reflected in the final cut of the movie. I mean, this is, I'm just speculating because it, as a marketing standpoint, it kind of makes sense for me to be like, well, Spider-Man just made a lot of money and nobody cares about Morbius. And this has been delayed 700 times. Let's tell them this is in the Spider-Man universe. Which Spider-Man universe? The Spider-Man universe. I think I think it would make sense if they, if, if in this universe, I mean, Spider-Man is, is, is your hero, right? I mean, Morbius, they're turning into an anti-hero and Venom's an anti-hero and all, blah, blah, blah. And Craven probably will be too. But eventually, like, they gotta be bad guys at some point. 
You need Spider-Man. So why not just pull up your pants and be like, Miles Morales is the Spider-Man in the Sony-verse. And just be like, this is its own thing. It's obviously in the multiverse. And next time you bring all the Spider-Man together, you throw in Miles Morales with Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield. And, Tom, and you're like, hey, there you go. And you don't worry about the other stuff. That's Because you have that. Or Spider-Gwen. Just do something. Throw in a Spider-Man of your own. Throw that version in there and be like this is that version and then you can even have your own spider-man movie that's not associated with the mcu and then you make all the profit on it so i i, I mean i don't know how their rights are working on that anymore they probably are like no <laughs> no uh miles morales i don't know but that's where i stand like throw in them you have such so much potential and opportunities there to do something and uh and instead you're just confusing everybody and you're delaying a movie that nobody was craving for in the first place i now that that's a thing like people don't ask for movies right like we get what we get and we go to see it but i think when it comes to comic book films though it's different it's like if the you know like the mcu has carte blanche now to do whatever they want because they have established themselves but so far sony's had mar uh venom like they've had venom and now they're gonna be like hey, and I, I applaud them for trying with morbius but i also feel like what they're doing with Morbius, Craven, Madam Web, and all this stuff, it feels like if they had a streaming service, all of this would play a lot better as straight <laughs> to streaming or series on the streaming service rather than throwing them in the theater. Because they're also, I mean, Jay Leto's, uh, I guess, a star, but he's not a box office draw, I wouldn't say. And Aaron Taylor Johnson's not a box office draw. It's not like they're getting, I mean, Tom Hardy's their biggest star, and it's not like, you know, I don't. I don't know if Craven or Morbius are big enough on their own to generate excitement without somebody like a bigger name portraying them. Because okay, okay, Chris Hemsworth, Hemsworth was a nobody when he got Thor. He was Captain, uh, the original Captain Kirk, Captain uh, Tiberius Kirk. But then, like, you had Robert Downey Jr. already establishing how amazing Iron Man was at that point. Like, you know, like, you already had stuff like that. And Robert Downey Jr. wasn't a huge name, but he was Robert Downey Jr. He just wasn't the Robert Downey Jr. he is now. I don't know if you're there yet with Sony, and uh, I don't know if they'll get there. No. They are marketing this movie to just cater to the the junkies of shared stuff. Um, and... That's not going to spell a good fate for this movie. And I hate to sound like a negative jerk when I say that, because you're right, I have not seen this movie yet. I can't pass judgment on it because that wouldn't be fair. But like when you and I'm I have plans for the Morbius movie to be the next video essay that I talk about on my channel, um, because of how odd this movie is and its existence is. But I mean, you look at another movie with another character slash group of characters that nobody cared about coming out in a shared universe. And you look at the difference between Morbius's trailer and this trailer, Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, Guardians of the Galaxy's first trailer didn't come out saying, look how connected to the Avengers this is. No, it came out and said, look at this crazy, cool, fun comic book movie we're going to make and how big and colorful and insane and vibrant it's going to be. You're going to have a blast with this. And we did. And that was one of Marvel's best trailers. And so the fact that Morbius, or rather that Sony feels like they need to sell this movie on its connected tissue, it just, it tells me they got zero faith in this film. Um, so I can't have faith in something if the producers and the studio doesn't have faith in it either. I don't know. Well, I'm going to go see it March 31st and uh, I will report on what I found this one to be, I don't, I don't know. I, like I said, I hope it's good. I mean, I hope, why not? You know, I think sure. the, the one thing it has going for it is Moon Knight. And apparently Moon Knight's really good. Everyone's loving Moon Knight. And Moon Knight is also zany and in Marvel. And so, you know, it's kind of, <laughs> and, Blade, and Blade is coming. So you kind of have that supernatural element working for it. It should, I mean, it, this might've been better if they delayed it even further and like let Moonlight kind of run its course and then really piggyback on the success of Moon Knight. People really seem to enjoy it and been like, hey, you like Moon Knight? Watch this thing. This is vampires. That's the same type of, you know, supernatural, supernatural. Let's do it. Uh, but it doesn't look like they I mean, obviously, one is Disney, one Sony, but at the same time, they're both Marvel characters that you could totally piggyback off of each other 
and use to some extent. Uh, un- unofficially use, I should say. But an- anyway, Andrew, that's, that's going to be the end of the show. We're going to wrap it up. It's Monday. It's manic. We've done it. We talked Riddler. We talked Lady Sticks. And we've talked um, Morbius. <laughs> Which is a normal Monday. Usually it's on Mondays, Monday. I talk about those three people. So Those are all you ever talk about on Mondays. And I'm like, I don't know. Who is this? Why do you keep talking to me about this? <laughs> but thank you so much for joining me today. Where can everybody find you at? You can find me on my channel, Andrew Fantasia, the YouTube channel, and on Instagram, Andrew underscore Fantasia. And if you like me and you think I'm cool and you like stories no. that I write, then you can buy this book. This is called Side Scroller, and I wrote it, and it's orange. There it is. That's it. You can find this on Amazon right now. If you don't like big bricks of paperback like this, you can get an ebook. That's fine. I'm not going to judge you if you get an ebook, but paperbacks give me more money. So that's always nice. And James has fully recommended the book. He gives it a 1.5 out of 7. Out of 7. Put it on Kobo and we can all be happy. Buy your book on Amazon. Uh, we're, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, give us a like and a subscribe. And until next time, may you be the master of your own universe. Sticks. <laughs>